I think about privacy a lot, and some of you may not think about it at all, but whether you think about it or not, there's a whole industry evolving around it every single day. The privacy tech landscape continues to be on the rise, especially post-pandemic, which has resulted in an abundance of new startups, careers, and frankly, entrepreneur, entrepreneur opportunities around the space, which all of you know I'm very passionate about. Today, we're joined by a guest who is neck deep, maybe even deeper than that, in this world, my friend Adam Tovum. Uh, he's an advisor to uh, numerous privacy groups and startups from the Future of Privacy Forum, Anonos, Keepsake, Jebit. Uh, he's been a, a serial entrepreneur in the space. He was the co-founder of Nth Party, uh, which was actually recently acquired by Magnite. Uh, he was the co-founder of Trust Layers. Uh, and before that, he even did a stint in the ad tech and media side of the world, which I have a sneaky suspicion drove his interest in privacy uh, by working in leadership roles at firms like JumpTap, which was actually acquired by Millennial Media. He also happens to be a partner at Chameleon Collective, where he specializes in this area as well. So I'd like all of you to join me and my guest, Adam Tobum, a self-proclaimed privacy tech addict, as we discuss his passion for the industry and basically it's how it's changed his life for the better. Um, so this episode, <laughs> whether you're interested in a career privacy tech or an entrepreneur in the space, or you really just want to stay uh, involved and up to date with this kind of really crazy, very fast moving landscape, uh, is going to be all for you. And with that, here we go with another week of OSHIP. Hey, buddy. Good to have you on our ship. How are you? I'm doing great. It's an it's an honor to be here, uh, part of such esteemed company. Great. Oh, uh, thanks, man. You know, I have to be honest. I, I last night I, was, I had a crazy long work day. I think I've worked from seven thirty in the morning until past midnight. It's been a little crazy, and I don't know if the sleep deprivation was making me get extra ex eccentric. But I was debating pranking you today by shaving off my beard and not coming with glasses on. So we just had these two very cleanly hewn, you know, kind of uh, nerds basically talking about privacy. Ready? I've I've been b mistaken for far worse. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I uh, I uh, I was got we've got a big meeting next week. I was like, I can't lose the beard in advance of that. My wife told me I look like a scr a screaming baby head when I don't have a beard. So uh, you pull it off. I apparently do not. So. <laughs> uh, you know, hats off to you. Well, um, you know, today I've been really looking forward to today's chat. Uh, there's a lot of content that we can get through. You and I have had a lot of geeky chats about this subject over the years, and I'm, I'm really thankful that you're going to come on, on our ship and, and have more geeky chats about that uh, with an audience. Uh, so speaking of that audience, uh, whether you're uh, you know tuning in via Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, or any of the different platforms we stream in, um, if you've got a, a question, uh, please put it in the chat. We'll do our best to address it. We'd love for this to be an interactive um, experience. Uh, and you know, whether you do or not, I've got a ton of questions I'm going to ask Adam and I think should make for a really engaging um, conversation. Um, so just to, to start this off, uh, and, and, and I don't want to be overly pedantic on this, on this subject, but I think it's really important to align on, on what privacy is before we can get into privacy tech. So uh, when you think about privacy, and I think a lot of people don't really break it down to this nuance, there's a, a lot of different forms that can take. We could be talking about physical privacy, uh, yeah. behavioral privacy, decisional privacy, yeah. and, and information privacy. Do you have a specific focus in this area, or does it kind of dabble in a couple of different places within that? So uh, I actually get asked this question a lot. <laughs> By the way, you're the only person on earth who this gets asked this question a lot. <laughs> Is that really the sad state of your existence? How do we really get asked? I can't believe those. Oh, people ask me this every day. I'm like, really? It took yeah, me 20 yeah. minutes to write that question. My brothers are watching right now. They're rolling their eyes. Oh, like, yeah, that's about that's about his best put forward. Uh, so I get asked this a lot, and and I like to talk about it at a very basic level that even my Aunt Judy could understand, <laughs> and that is really, it's historically been called the, the right to be left alone. Um, and, and when I work with uh, 
CEOs, chief revenue officers, chief marketing officers, because a lot of times we're talking about people-based data, data about us as consumers, patients, or citizens. A lot of times people say, oh yeah, privacy, and they immediately start a discussion that's really about security. And so I often play back my trust layer, uh, trust layers, uh, co-founders uh, phrase, uh, Danny Weitzner describes it so well. He says, security is about protecting against the bad, right? Bad actors getting in and taking data or personal data leaking out or being exposed that you didn't want exposed. Privacy is a scalable way to attest to the good. And so we're really talking about that, especially when we talk about privacy tech is that there's all this data being gathered about Adam and Freddie inside these large data systems. Think of books like Surveillance Capitalism. But there's lots of data being gathered about us. And uh, how does an organization that wants to be responsible, but responsible about it, how do they find a way programmatically to say, hey, look, we're on the up and up here. Uh, a lot of mm -hmm. privacy regulation is uh, designed uh, a lot of times to be more aspirational or focus on goals. So sometimes when it really comes down to the details, uh, there's a lot to work out there. And privacy is about really attesting to that good. Mm. And, and so when we kind of lean into today's subject more specifically, what, what is privacy tech exactly? And like, how does it fit into that, that broader definition? Yeah, so um, I think about privacy tech in a couple of ways. And, you know, today we're going to talk about it from the perspective of a consumer and then also a business practitioner, right? And so from a consumer, we see a lot of privacy tech today. A lot of times it's just about monitoring or control of our data. Those social platforms allow us to see how the data is being used. The social platforms also try in line to describe, hey, why are you seeing this ad? Right. Because everybody I mean, if I had a nickel for every time somebody says, yeah, I was having a conversation with a friend and then all of a sudden I saw an ad for that product on Facebook. So therefore, Facebook is listening to me. I'm like, ah, That's a huge leap. So is, so is that is that BS? Can we can we can we call that one way or the other? I have yet uh, to hear of anything confirming that I, I also think, you know, everyone remembers the New York Times uh, article about the father who gets the flyer for it, it is addressed to his 19 year old daughter. And it's the target uh, target sending a flyer that says stuff about pregnancy uh, mm -hmm. products. And he flies off the handle. He calls up target. He says, this is enough. How could you do this to a 19 year old? Two weeks later, he calls back and he says, ouch, I was wrong. She actually is in her you know second trimester. Um, and, you know, and, and Target, one marketer cynically said that the, the, the problem from a marketing perspective that Target uh, created there was they were too specific, right? They yeah. didn't kind of like raise it up. But so, so is Facebook, uh, are any of the social platforms listening to you and then uh, packaging that uh, into ads? I think that's, uh, I think that's a, a pretty big leap based yeah. on what I've, uh, what I've heard today. Um, but that's what privacy tech means to consumers, I think, is the, the ability to monitor and, and have some control over the use of data and, and participate in that in some way. And, and again, the right to be left alone when you want to be left alone. I think as business practitioners, it's really hard to unpack what privacy tech is because there's great companies like the One Trust and the Wire Wheels that are doing a lot of automation of workflow so that if one of your consumers, one, someone who's a data, they're called data subjects. If somebody says, hey, can I have that data about me? They have more and more rights mm -hmm. to do that. But how do you do that? How do you do it efficiently? There, there's a lot of privacy tech there. The part that really interests me is what happens when companies are trying to create more uses for the data? They've got sure. AI, ML-driven algorithms, and they want to build privacy tech into that whole uh, process. And so, you know, the nth parties that's, of that's the so world. Fascinating. I never thought about that before. So, you, you know, you think about, let's use like AI art for a second. So AI art, you're taking concepts and, and they use AI and machine learning to effectively fill in the gaps to create something. And if you think about what a lot of firms are trying to do with, with customer data, they're trying to build these profiles and pictures of you a persona that they can target or communicate with or create personalized experiences for. 
And it never dawned on me that you could use AI or machine learning to effectively look at subsets of data and look at patterns and kind of effectively paint the rest of the picture, if you know what I mean, on someone to, to create a more detailed profile. That's pretty that, well. That, absolutely. And look, you know, there are lots of data scientists out there listening right now and saying, you know, yeah, of course, Freddie. Hello, mm -hmm. like, welcome hey, to the last I'm not an expert. I think a lot of other people are, you know, aren't, I think. I mean, but, but a lot of people kind of aren't. Patterns, but... Yeah, yeah, a lot of people aren't. And, and more and more, we're going to see some of the benefits when that does happen, yeah. right? Mapping programs can predict yeah. when there's yeah. rush hour traffic on your way home. Yeah. Uh, marketers or e-commerce uh, providers can offer some really valuable discounts for some super relevant things that you're purchasing. And then we, our minds always go to some of the, the fear, or the bad that can come out of it. Uh, one, someone once said it was uh, accidental algorithmic cruelty. <laughs> and I think that's, it's, you know, it, it, it's sometimes what, what happens when we let some of these algorithms run amok. And from a privacy practitioner standpoint, anybody, uh, one of us who could be on the revenue side, the marketing side, and we want to attest to the fact that we're, we're handling the data properly. How do you show that? How do you, how do you avoid that, uh, those algorithmic black holes or those algorithmic, you know, oops, we really screwed up. Uh, here situations. That's that's a part of what I think privacy tech uh, can be about. I, I want to take it back a couple notches. So we we jumped into you told you know we've got two very excitable guys on the <laughs> show between the two of us. You know, and and I think one of the things that I, I love about um, you know, chatting with you about the subject and why I think so many people like talking to you about the subject is the fact that your your enthusiasm is 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 very infectious. And so uh, rarely do I kind of say uh, when someone I start thinking about something like data or privacy or whatever, like, when did you fall in love? And when I, and when I mean my fall in love is, uh, you know, what was that like moment where like, I mean, this is clearly an obsession for you. And I mean that as a compliment, to be clear. Uh, yeah. So um, like when, when, when was that moment? Can you, can you figure out like that moment where it really started to click for you? Please don't say you were like six or something, but, but. Ready, <laughs> ready. It would be ridiculous to say that I was six. I was actually 10. No, seriously. <laughs> so I was 10. Our math curriculum, you were required to do something in basic programming or something. Definitely dating myself here. And uh, so I did that. And I was like, all right, I'm done. So like, I want to teach myself more about programming. And I started building a whole contact database. And I wanted to sort of do things with it. And then I started with summer jobs, uh, college uh, jobs as well. And uh, just working more and more with personal data, you have all this exhaust. And then I think the moment where it really crystallized to me was working in uh, Europe um, at the early days of what was then two and a half and early 3G mobile telecom, where you had massive amount of exhaust about consumers. And then in ad tech, same thing. You had all this data and, uh, you know, the Cambridge Analytica scandals I just aside. Sure we're using the same language. What, what does exhaust mean? Does that, does that just mean like just, just, just mountains of data being created by people? Is that what exhaust means? Yeah. A lot of times a data practitioner will think about two aspects of data about us. One is our, just our profile, right? It doesn't change much. Um, I mean, sure, age evolves, but your birth date doesn't change. Or even the decade you were born, if you want to be privacy preserving, more privacy preserving about it. But um, there's profile information about us. But then as Freddie browses the internet and goes from one a news site to a social media site to a gaming site, you're generating all this clickstream exhaust. You're generating, I mean, if you can picture an Excel spreadsheet, it's just more and more rows and they're mm -hmm. all attached to your identifier. And if we're doing our job as privacy tech, practitioners, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're cleansing that data or we're, we're trying our best to either pseudonymize it um, or, or bring it up to a level where it's still useful, <laughs> but, but privacy preserving. Mm -hmm. But that exhaust is just stuff that we leave behind on, you know, in these, in these data stores, mm -hmm. in these data lakes. And it, it could be consumer, you know, browser behavior or, you know, as patients, there's a lot of medical record history. There's claims data history. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, it's a helpful term when you're trying to think about 
how wide your aperture is to how many columns of that exhaust you can see and then how many rows. Mm. I didn't mean to send you off on a, a tangent on that. So would so so would you say this kind so this moment then that you kind of really knew this was going to be a big career path for you was basically working with this German telecom firm. So yeah, at the time it was the world's fastest growing uh, mobile telecom operator. Um, and uh, I had the pleasure of living in Dusseldorf for two years, uh, working awesome. with them. They're, they're now Vodafone Germany. Um, and I feel like I've heard of them being sarcastic as hell, just to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, some people in the U.S. haven't haven't yeah, heard yeah. of Vodafone. Fair it's enough, one of the yeah. largest mobile telecom yeah, my, it, 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 for the for the Yanks. It's so like might as well be AT and T, basically. Of course, of course. <laughs> Yeah. So um, I, first of all, I had a great experience there. You know, I got to learn the German language and I, I just discovered a love of travel and, you know, getting exposed to, to new cultures. But I also, you know, I saw how powerful uh, the data, I mean, some of the first mobile content that we were developing there, uh, trying to figure out uh, just even something as basic as how well those data plans can be segmented and offered to consumers so that so that people who wanted to get access to mobile data and and new mobile services could could afford to do it uh, could do it in a way that makes sense in their lives it was really an opportunity uh, to touch a very large population and I think that was a moment working in a country like Germany which historically has been very privacy aware by it you know with its citizens and and with privacy in general. It just, you know, you sort of bake the two together. One, large amounts of data exhaust, there's that term again, can be really powerful and you can use it a lot to expand the value of that, that data you're gathering, but also you need to be incredibly responsible uh, along the way. Mm -hmm. commercial um, one, one, one of the things, I think Germany and Europe in general have um, some pretty particular rules around privacy. So I'm sure that had a big um, impact on you in general. But I'd love to understand what's your point of view on how much control uh, everyday individual users should have around their data? I think they should have a lot more visibility. Um, I often get, uh, as, as a uh, business practitioner, I'm a little torn on how much control people truly want, right? Mm. People will say, if you pull yeah, them, exactly. hey, I'm in control of all my data, but they'll say that about a lot of things. People say, I hate advertising, but then when you come down to a commercial trade-off, it's like, well, you have this free social media platform where you can break up with your girlfriend mm -hmm. uh, and, and connect with your sports team uh, mm -hmm. all the time. And micro communities, people start to we see this all the time, right? People don't delete their profiles, even in the face of scandals, uh, the usage just continues to grow. So, so what should people have? Well, they should have as much control as makes them feel comfortable. And I think there's lots of privacy advocacy, advocacy groups that would say, hey, they should have 100% control. I mean, there's entire companies being built where they're trying to say, look, consumers control everything. It shouldn't be the social media platform. The, the challenge is as consumers, you know, there is a bit, big difference between what they're asking for, what we all think should be the case, and commercially what's viable. And that's what I love as, as about the entrepreneurial scene is people are always looking for that product market fit where you find a consumer's burning need, something they truly want, where they're willing to separate some of their attention, budget, whatever, uh, whatever it might be. But I think, you know, as entrepreneurs, we need to find and, and offer products that people truly will, will mm -hmm. separate either with their time or their money mm -hmm. uh, for. It can't just be about the should. It's a certainly, a, I'm not dismissing that invalid question. Here's the tricky thing I find with like with privacy. So in, in some of my roles over the years, I've obviously done a lot of market research thing. And I feel like this is one of those things. So if you interviewed 100,000 consumers, everyone said, do you want to protect your privacy? Everyone would be like a like huge response. Yes. So it comes across as a, as a really, really important um, issue that people want to, want to care about. But I think there's a major gap in what that really translates down to. So there's like this gut 
reaction from all consumers say, of course, I, I private, we all want privacy. I don't want my neighbors looking in my windows, so to speak. Right. And yeah. you can liken that as a very, you know, sim a very simple uh, comparison to privacy. Um, but then, you know, I think there's value exchanges that happen out there that um, create a problem. One, one of the things I feel like, you know, with all the, and I don't want to get into ad tech today specifically, but I do feel it's important to mention this. Um, you know, with all the changes that have been made with, with uh, you know, mobile platforms with iOS and, and I think pending ones with Android um, around, uh, you know, people being able to be tracked for ads and things like that, you know, there's been a, a really a downside repercussion. And, and, and as a kind of, you know, an entrepreneur as entrepreneur, as I like to refer to myself sometimes, I feel like that actually, well, I guess good for consumers on some level, actually was really bad for a lot of small businesses. You know, a lot of these ad platforms, whether it's Facebook or Google, that you can go out there and quite easily, even as a small business owner, go and set up and, and, and reach, you know, customers you couldn't reach before, it, it wrecked their, you know, their, their ad costs and their ability to really do this effectively. And actually, in my opinion, that put more um, control and more favor back to the big businesses again, because a lot of these ad platforms effectively democratized access to very high end ad tools to, to, to the everyday business owners. And, um, and so I do feel like sometimes this, you know, some of the things that are happening there, maybe, yeah, they, again, good for consumers, but but is that really good for, for small business, which ultimately is good for everyday people because it creates jobs and, and creates stability in our economy? So, Well, I mean, I've been working with a lot of people over the last year uh, for some of the changes that were done to mobile device mm -hmm. tracking and how that wrecked the ad buying economics. And then it, mm -hmm. it wrecked, it really hit small businesses hard mm -hmm. for their ability to effectively just get the word out about their product mm -hmm. and acquire new customers. So mm -hmm. so I think there's a there is... Uh, more need for improvement there. But overall, I, I think starting up a small business today and having access to the platforms and to third party ad tech places, the likes of a trade desk or, you know, all these demand side capabilities that can go to the, to the magnites of the world and get a lot more precision out of their campaigns and a better return on their ad spend. I would disagree. I would say overall, it's been a net positive for small businesses. Yeah, there's a lot of headaches along the way. And if I put on my nerdy privacy tech hat now mm -hmm. and my, my watching out at the privacy landscape, you are right that um, as these data privacy regimes ask more of businesses to protect data, the large social media platforms can easily just restrict either for privacy concerns, antitrust concerns, they're not going to share that data. And so they hold it more tightly and therefore advertisers can't get the type of learnings um, mm. out of their marketing and advertising campaigns that they used to be able to get. And so it, it, it does create a problem and it hits small businesses mm. pretty hard. The more we, the more we ask of these um, larger platforms to, to care for privacy. So, so something needs to evolve mm. there, but, but I'd say overall, I, I think there's a lot, of upside now and, and in the future for small business. I want to ask one more question on this subject and then and move on to kind of some of the core core subject of today's episode. Um, and it's just kind of leaning in a little bit more around uh, where we were uh, a moment ago. So um, one of the things I don't think is explicitly said, like, you know, uh, the, you know, you hear all these conversations about how you know, data is the new oil, and and and, you know, and, and how it's this big industry-wide kind of uh, commodity on some level. But I, I want to talk about this more at the micro level because I think to a lot of today is about privacy tech, and we're talking about how it affects consumers and how privacy tech can improve yeah. people's personal lives. And and I think there's this unsaid thing that happens in the world today that that should be talked about. And I think that is that there are all these things that are free on the internet. There are you know, services, there are apps, there's all these things that we use. And um, it, the people in the industry understand what I'm about to talk about, but I don't think consumers is ever as explicit as saying, hey, so just to be clear, it's not really free. We're going to track all your behaviors. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna track you. We're going to look, we're going to take your personal information. We're probably going to sell it, even if we're anonymizing it in some way. And, you, and, and these consumers and these everyday users are effectively paying for these services 
through uh, the value of their data because that's that's what the yes. apps and services can use. And so I don't I don't think that's necessarily a, a bad thing because I think there is a value exchange that's happening there. But I wish people would just come out and say it, you know, uh, and, and maybe if it was more explicit, maybe that would lean into better privacy tech or better understanding of privacy um, because I think, you know, it's I again. It, it's unfair, I think, from a business owner standpoint to say, "Hey, you want all the free stuff, but you don't want to do the value exchange with me." But then people need to make a decision about it um, as individual users. So I'd, I'd love to just kind of get your reaction to that and 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 see what your opinion is, and maybe even get a feeling for what you how, how you feel like the broader privacy world feels about it. Not to make you the voice of everyone. <laughs> yes, boy, what a what a heavy responsibility. No <laughs> Placed on my shoulders there. Um, I I think if I wish consumers knew more about um, not to sound uh, drastic here, but how liquid their data was. I wish they knew more about how it was being traded on data and media platforms so much because I I think they'd be more aware of this and care more about privacy as a first order concern. I also wish they knew how much it was being protected, even by folks that don't do as much about privacy as they should. Uh, the fact that, uh, you know, Adam Tovum's first and last name or, you know, people fear uh, too much in that they think their first and last name's being passed around um, just out in the cold, but also uh, they probably need to know more uh, about that. I also think from a business perspective, it's really hard. I mean, Coke doesn't come right out and say, look, we're just being really honest here. This is overpriced colored sugar water. Here, <laughs> buy it. They're selling happiness, right? Every business yeah. has something uh, that they're trying to sell. So this is, the, uh, this is like the outside voice versus the inside voice that uh, we need to be careful about. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so uh, I'd love to actually take a question from the audience. Uh, so I'm going to put this up on screen. Uh, so uh, Chris Maloney uh, says, uh, great discussion. What are the biggest challenges for marketers going forward as data is more constricted, especially California laws, et cetera? Yeah, I think this is a real, uh, real challenge for businesses. And he specifically mentions the California law. So CCPA is the one that's currently uh, in effect. It's going to be, it is being, uh, its successor is CPRA. It's gobbledygook acronyms for most people, I'm sure. But ultimately, um, it allows California and sometimes by default, just about every digital company out there in the U.S. Uh, to say, look, you have a right to say to a business, not only should you not sell my data, but even don't share it unless there's some very specific parameters around just use it for some analysis, but don't share it so that I'll be retargeted elsewhere, for instance, because mm -hmm. that is being seen as a sale. And so businesses really need to take a long, hard look at not only the necessary steps. I mean, they, they, they require a do not sell um, link to be prominently placed on the website, but also just how are you architecting your whole customer data strategy? I think, how are you thinking about your acquisition, retention, and marketing lifecycle economics? I think you need to look at that and change out uh, your whole customer data strategy so that you can better insulate yourself. That's the one thing responsible businesses could be doing so much more. There's so many privacy tech tools out there. And, and there are some that are doing a great job of trying to be privacy aware and allowing for collaboration and not building in a lot of security. I think Nth Party was a great example of using really top-notch uh, MPC uh, type uh, encryption, um, cipher modes uh, using MPC as well. And so I love that, you know, Magnite's bringing this to greater scale. Uh, but I think, but I think lots of marketers, um, I think, you know, anybody ho holding personal data should be looking at how they architect that data strategy going forward. Cause I don't think you want to spend the next 10 years guessing about not only the data privacy regimes, but you know, consumer data advocacy groups are going to start creating headaches for you too. Mm. Um, really appreciate you addressing that question uh, head on. Great, great answer. Um, I want to use it as a segue. Um, and uh, one of the core things we said we were going to address today in today's show was basically how privacy tech was affecting kind of everyday consumers. So as someone who really 
you know, with the pulse on the pulse in the industry and what's going on there. What do you think are some of the most um, positive things that you see coming out and maybe whether it's today or in the next couple of years, um, they're going to have a positive impact on the lives of everyday people? So I think people already see it with the uh, platforms making their dashboards more readily available. I remember at the very beginning when the privacy controls were introduced, say on the mobile devices, you had to drill down. I mean, I'm in this business. I, mean, I was in the mobile ad business and to drill down and say, hey, turn off my identifier for advertising. It, you know, we'd have contests. How quickly can you find it? And it's like minutes later, you're still drilling through the menu. So I think uh, the dashboards are becoming more available, both uh, for the platforms and then more monitoring uh, on the mobile devices. And then uh, a lot of uh, password-less um, technologies out there. You can use LastPass or 1Password to kind of mm -hmm. make sure that it's really complicated and hard to crack, and it's a different password for everything. But then ultimately, I think the privacy piece is finding ways, vaults, where you can safely house some of that data and, and use it for good, right? It doesn't just have to be, like I said, about security protecting against the bad and just coming up with a password. But I think over time, we'll be able to have more portable vaults uh, mm -hmm. so that we can in some way participate in that. That could just be a free cow in your simulation game. It could be a free upgrade or a free set of armor uh, in your game, or it could be some shopping discounts or access to gated content. Uh, but but that value has to flow to the consumers somehow. Mm -hmm. And I and I'm almost positive right now uh, in 2022 that it's not in the form of giving consumers payment because mm -hmm. consumers think their data, a certain chunk of their data may be worth 100 bucks. But the marketing ecosystem literally says, yeah, 10 cents, maybe a buck. I mean, it is orders of it magnitude. It's just not worth, the, not worth the aggravation for most people to deal with, quote unquote, monetizing their, their personally, at least in a financial sense. I think when you've got, you know, that's why I think this value exchange thing is, is so, so big. And for, well, it's, um, it's value exchange. But, but before that is what does the consumer, how do, how do we make trade-offs all the time? All right. Behavioral economists ask this ask this all the time. How do we make trade-offs and decisions in our lives? Lori Craner at Carnegie Mellon is doing a great job of thinking mm -hmm. through the user experience implications of a lot of these mm -hmm. privacy mm -hmm. tools, like follow what she's doing, like a lot, a lot of the future mm -hmm. of uh, privacy tech from a consumer standpoint mm -hmm. is going to hinge on issues like the ease of use, the ease of explaining how your data is being used. Like you said before, just mm -hmm. own up and tell me <laughs> how it's being used well that's hard when a limited screen real estate uh, yeah. on mobile screens where we spend most of our time there's there's a lot still to yeah. be done well, and it also and then it also always sounds like total gobbledygook as well you know uh small tangent by the way uh you know some of you who uh watch or listen to the show know my my mother lives with my wife and i and and um you know one of the funny things about having your mother live with you it doesn't matter how old you are it's instantly like you're a kid or a teenager again. So when I asked my mother to bring me a tea before the show, about 10 seconds before we go live, she walks in and hands me the single most embarrassing coffee mug in our entire <laughs> arsenal. I've been trying to keep it like slightly off the screen. And then I want to have these moments where it's like, you know, it's like I just have like this vision of myself and like braces on at like 12 and be like, mom, you're embarrassing me with all my podcast friends. I'm trying to look forward <laughs> over here. Just... Not a good look. Not a good look. So thanks, Mom. But a shout out yeah, to you and a special you. thanks out to Jackie Kevrol for buying me this hilarious coffee mug while simultaneously very embarrassing. <laughs> Actually, anyway, we're back now. <laughs> yeah. For those who are still living with their parents, they should be thinking about a career somewhat related uh, to privacy tech. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Ready? How can you I was embarrassing yourself on a web series. Yeah, yeah. I was talking about people in high school, college, uh, but maybe, maybe uh, it's uh, for those of us in our careers. Well, now that you brought it up, I was going to ask you something about about careers in the uh, the privacy tech space. So, what you know, what what where, where is that? You know, what does a career in privacy tech even look like? I mean, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of different paths, but you know, what would you be? Would, you know, when you think about recommendations there, if someone has an interest in this, and they're maybe at the earlier stage of their career, or, or later in thinking about reinventing themselves, you know, yeah. what, what are some interesting places to play? Well, I think uh, let's start with some easy answers right at the core. If you are pursuing an engineering uh, degree and you end up combining that either with a law degree and you have an interest in privacy, 
or sometimes people find in their careers, they get into these aspects of business, like in fraud, you know, I mean, I used to work with a lot of uh, people in the privacy tech part of MasterCard, and they were people who had experience, you know, MasterCard for decades had to deal with fraud. And you have a lot of policy and use limitations that you think about at a functional, non-technical level. You got to combine that skill set, I think, with some technical understanding. But it just it doesn't have to be people in tech and law. You could be in the marketing uh, mm -hmm. area of things, and you could be working with privacy tech companies trying to explain it um, to uh, the the company's prospective customers. Mm -hmm. That to me is a great place to be as an entrepreneur because mm -hmm. you're trying to find product market fit. You're trying to find this burning pain uh, of how to make mm -hmm. use uh, mm -hmm. of the data and uh, make use, um, uh, you know, create more value from data, but still, you know, be willing to buy a, a privacy tech product uh, from a, from a new vendor that, you know, you probably never heard of before. On, on, on a scale of one to 10, when you think about like being an entrepreneur and going out there and trying to solve like, you know, meaningful issues of this kind of bur burgeoning, you know, area of privacy and, and data and so on. Where, where do you kind of rank this in the like, hey, if you're like, I'm going to start my first business <laughs> and, and I want to go and attack a new industry. I, I'm kind of guessing, is this like an eight, nine, 10? Or, or do you think, or am I, I be This is a 10. This is a 10, dude. A 10. I, I think it's, so So here's the thing though. Um, I One of the top, and I was very fortunate uh, to meet, meet them, one of the top venture capitalists here in the US, mm -hmm. um, got on the phone and said, was tar tackling two great things. One, uh, climate. And two, uh, privacy, you know, of use of personal data, privacy and advertising, privacy and media, you know, everything like that. And, and I think, you know, if you're an entrepreneur to solve for some of these privacy tech things, okay, fine, we still need to have a planet <laughs> 50 years from now. So yeah. that's the huge nod to climate tech. But, but the if we're super private about it, no one has to know how screwed we are. <laughs> Shh, keep it quiet. The Earth will never know the difference. Um, that that burning hole in the ozone layer. It's just it's all a hoax. So so I but I I think privacy tech. I mean, it doesn't have to be in ad tech. It doesn't have to be in you know uh, patient data analytics. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be the stuff that a trust layers we did uh, with the likes of Palantir um, with protecting a lot of citizens data. It just could be in an area where those use limitations are incredibly important. And I, those can those can make their way into a lot of our parts of our lives. Uh, I yeah. think there's a lot of places to go. So you could be a marketer, you could be a lawyer, you could be an engineer. Um, there, there's a lot of different places uh, uh, to take this. So um, I, yeah, I want to kind of change gears a little bit. But to, for those of you who've been long, you know, long standing with ship viewers, uh, you know, this question is coming. Uh, but as a reminder, for those of you who've never watched our ship before, a huge chunk of this show is about uh, giving entrepreneurs or leaders uh, or experts who, um, who you know, been around the block a little bit to kind of reflect on different parts of their career, or some different experiences they have, and then knowledge what we like to call in the show, oh, ship moments. And this is typically a moment where uh, something's gone a bit off the rails, uh, you know, and um Maybe, you, maybe they learned something important from it that shaped the way that they approached their career or their entrepreneur, uh, in entrepreneurial ventures or businesses, uh, could have shaped the way that they are, or act as a leader today. Um, or in some cases, I don't know if it does any of that, but is damn funny now, but wasn't very funny uh, when, <laughs> when it happened to them at the time. But I think you know, listening to how uh, people deal with some of this adversity, I think is, is a really important lesson for all of us. So uh, with all that build up, uh, not to put you too much on the spot, Adam, but is there any point in your career you can think of a, like a great oh ship moment that you've had to deal with that's related to privacy and privacy tech? Ab absolutely. Um, a, a clear moment uh, for me was June 2007. So in May 2007, I joined JumpTap. And JumpTap at that point, I don't know if they had raised upwards of almost 90, going on $90 million in venture capital. They just, they just they called, jumped up to media network for those who don't, don't know. JumpTap, yeah, it was a, it was a uh, started, started as a mobile search company going yeah. to AT&T and Verizon, right. you know, the big wireless carriers saying, hey, carriers, uh, in this new mobile shift to the mobile platform, own the targeting, own the profiles, build a mobile search engine, don't let the consumer search engines... 
you know, take over your consumers and, and have their roadmap dictate how those consumers search on mobile. So we were the mobile search platform and all we needed were the carriers to be directly connected with the phone. And then I joined in May 07 and in June 07, 2007, a tiny little thing was announced and it was called an iPhone and Steve Jobs was the one announcing it and it completely cut out the carrier for huge amounts of content and mobile media that the carriers had been participating in. And we had to pivot like crazy. And then there was the 08 downturn. And the way we did it was uh, more relevant targeting and all those profiles that we had been focusing a lot of the, the product evolution on and the data. And we started doing a lot of stuff with data and started working with Jules Polonetsky, who created the Future Privacy Forum. It's a great organization. Every company should be a part of it. And, uh, and we set about doing some very forward uh, thinking. We, we, we set about really creating a whole new level of uh, data on mobile mm-hmm. that you could use in campaigns. And it's funny, we went from a search company to being an advertising company. And along the way, I think we became leaders in uh, some of the early uh, mobile uh, mobile privacy initiatives. Mm-hmm. I got to be involved in you know, co-founding some of those industry mm-hmm. standard bodies. It was a great experience for me, but it was that oh ship moment yeah. where- is, uh, is there kind of a key, a key learning that came from that? Uh, when you think about like, you reflect on it now in hindsight, you're like, hey, you know, whether it's a, a thinking about decision making or you know how to survive a pivot or a, anything like that that kind of left a big impression on you? I think it was how to survive a pivot. I mean, we had to re, recraft an entire company. We had to go through some difficult layoffs. We, we really had to think about what it came back to. And it was about creating value from those profiles, from the targeting and, and making sure it was done responsibly. So I feel like these tectonic plates can shift under you and you could be part of a company and thousands of people get laid off and you got to come back to like, what are you passionate about? What gets you up in the morning? But, but, but combine it with what's valuable in a differentiated way in, in the market. Um, so we're nearing the end of the show and I want to ask, I mean, just one or two more questions, but one, one has been um, very top of mind for me. Um, and that is uh, around remote work. So obviously, as I, you know, I've been working remotely for seven years now. You've been working remotely for you know, yeah. close to that, I'm guessing, at least maybe longer. Mm-hmm. Um, are there any particular implications for privacy when it comes to people that are remote workers and, and let's just get very digitally connected all the time? Yeah, I think we have to be very conscious of if you're using a work laptop and you're using work services and you're engaging in personal uh, behavior there, even if it's just with your friends from work, you you have to be conscious of blurring those lines more and more. Mm -hmm. Uh, You used to be, you just had your computer at work. And then when you were off with your friends on the weekend, that was fine. But what happens when you're off uh, at uh, some music festival uh, and you're filming yourself on your work phone um, filming. See, look, uh, there I am. <laughs> you're creating videos and you're sharing them, and uh, and it's on on work uh, work mm-hmm. technology that's that's mm-hmm. owned by a company, not by you. I think also uh, a lot of times we're trying to understand how to become more effective workers. So there's a lot of technology that wants to monitor our work usage. So how do we feel about our screens being scraped and recorded all mm-hmm. the time? Yeah, it's work related but um i think that balance of how uh you know sort of that creepy factor uh, i think you know large employers have to balance that while also uh trying to create a a more productive work environment Mm -hmm. um one last final question for you and it's uh, a a good one um what is your social security number no i'm just kidding Uh, we won't won't do that Uh, so um when you when you think about um be, you know, starting a, a company now. We talked. You said it was a ten earlier, um, and we, you know, we talked about some of the opportunities that are out there. But I think when you think about trying to get started as being an entrepreneur in this space, is there any advice that you would give um, any kind of you know people considering jumping into creating companies in the privacy tech space uh, that you know to try and maybe give them uh, an easier start than you had? Yeah, uh, I, I think it's actually no different than in other 
uh, okay. sectors. I was meeting with a very uh, successful entrepreneur yesterday, multiple times CEO, and she just kept on coming back to it. It's got to be about find the product market fit. You know, the entrepreneurial cliche is always I'd rather be selling painkillers than vitamins. And uh, I had one venture capitalist that I, I heard say, no, I, I don't want to be finding someone who's in pain. I want to find a bleeding head wound. Right. And that's a that's a rather graphic way of saying, look, I want to find the business that is saying I'm devoting too many people or too much a percentage of my budget to this right now. Yeah. And please come and solve it. And maybe it's yeah. around dealing with privacy, you know, data subject access requests and the workflows. There, Maybe it's about encrypting all the data and it's too locked down. And could I share and create uh, more collaboration with it more effectively, like all these clean room uh, tech uh, companies are trying to do right now, or the clean room killers that mm-hmm. that use better technology for that. So I, I I think it still just sort of comes down to finding that product market fit. Mm-hmm. Um, you can you can learn about that a lot online. Michael Scott here in the Boston area, a successful venture capitalist, created all these YouTube videos about that value prop and mm-hmm. I, and identifying that product market fit. That's just entrepreneurship one hundred and one. Find mm-hmm. that and then. Um, because you have to build that. Uh, uh, build yeah, it's funny. It 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 sound it getting down to basics and kind of quote unquote nailing the basics is something yeah. we talk a lot about with people. And you know, it's it, this is a great example, like some of the other tech that's out there, whether that people have been very focused on from blockchain to NFTs and a lot of the other things that have been um, you know very hyped in the last couple of years. And it's like people get so jazzed about the tech and the implications of tech that they don't. They don't remember the basics. Like if, if it doesn't nail, solve a meaningful problem for people, it's not going to ever be a big deal. It's not going to yeah. ever be, it's not going to have huge success. So um, so I'd like to just take a quick moment to thank all the people who've been listening or watching the show live. If you are watching the show uh, after, after the live event or you're listening in on any of the podcasts, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, please continue to support the show. Tell your friends, submit great guests to us, uh, give it a like, give it a share. All of those things really mean a, mean a lot to us. And we watch it and we pay attention. So thank you very much. And, and then, uh, Adam, thank you again for joining us. I really Thanks. enjoyed having you on today. It was a fun, fun chat, as expected. And uh, I look forward to continuing our, our, our nerdy conversations uh, in the future on a one-on-one basis. Well, thank you very much. And thanks everybody for watching. And, and then is there any quick, quickly, is there any uh, kind of places if people want to follow you or engage you, um, you know, what's the best way to kind of get in touch with you? I'd say LinkedIn. That's the easiest. Okay. Everyone's all about the LinkedIn these days. I love that. You know, so I, I'm, I'm in the same boat. So, uh, well, thanks again, everyone. Adam, thank you. And uh, we'll see you next week on O-Ship. <laughs>